This is Talk of Asian Marketing with a special emphasis on localized Chinese consumer behavior. Our website is ccc.qbook.tv, where you can find other audio and video episodes with photos, links, and information related to today's conversation. Subscribe to leave comments and access research episodes with applied topics and research reports. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. This afternoon, I'm going to look at service innovation from a fairly practical and localized viewpoint. So we're looking at the whole issue of localizing service quality for Chinese cultural preferences. So this follows on really quite nicely from what Clyde was talking about earlier today about local consumer preferences. For in this case, Zernau. I want to take this into the whole service area and look at how Chinese cultural preferences influence how people assess and think about service quality. So this afternoon's short agenda. I want to start off by talking a little bit about the role of customer service in the Far East context. Then probe this issue. What actually is service quality? And more specifically, to look at a Chinese perspective on service quality. And this is really some problem that we have right now. Both from a research point of view, we don't have a very clear answer to this. Though I'm going to suggest to you some broad parameters that we can actually employ to measure service quality from a practical point of view. And I know all of you here today. Are practical, hands-on managers who are looking for these kind of solutions. So this will give you a broad framework that you can apply in your customer contacts to identify how well you're performing, and potentially how you can improve in areas that are significant to local customers. So that will then form the summary of today's session to look at some of the implications from what we've talked about. Let's move right into the role of service in the Far East. So Professor Williamson really hits the nail nicely on the head. He says, you know, Asia's traditional model of economic development was often described as flying geese in formation. Then came along China. So this was shown so nicely in the Economist just a few years back now. How this little image of the panda was tearing through what、uh, we're all familiar with as fairly traditional economic approaches to growth, where we start with agriculture, move into the secondary sector of manufacturing, and finally towards services. His real point is, we need to wake up. We need to be clear that actually China's firing on all three cylinders. In other words, service. Is relevant here and now to the Chinese cultural space in China, where we are right now. We can think of this from two points of view, and I think these should resonate with some of you in the audience. We can look at this from a transaction mode or a relationship mode. So, transactions we're all pretty familiar with. We purchase a service. We purchase a good. Get the money. Pay the money. Get the good. Now, someone labelled this, and this is not the phrase I've used. The Wild West.、Uh, this was a phrase that I got just the other day talking to a businessman who's employed in installing air conditioning units in a variety of large industrial settings, and his phrase was often. The experience can be a little bit like the Wild West. Other companies also talk about their kind of difficulty of entering transaction mode. Where's the beef? Large, well-known restaurant chain doing business. They have a preferred supplier. Life goes on pretty smoothly for some time, and then one day they open up what they think is beef. They think it looks a little odd. Closer inspection shows that yes, actually it's pork steeped in beef blood. 
Now, that gives a real sense of transaction. What are we doing? We're paying for a good. We're receiving the, uh, the benefit. There's a transaction going on. And suppliers may try out to see if they can uh, offer some product where they can get away with it. But the uh, purchaser, of course, has got to be on guard about what they're getting, what they're receiving. Now, why does this happen? Why do we have that sense of sometimes suppliers, customers are in this transaction mode, whether it's B2B, B2C, often because it's the logic of the group. The supplier is operating at the possibility of creating business with the customer that's a transaction to bring business security. One more unit equals one more dollar. Ten more units equals ten more dollars. And ultimately, if you can do that enough times, you build financial security for a significant group. And generally, from the Chinese point of view, we're talking of the family. So there's a lot out there, and I'm sure we've all experienced that, where service seems to orientate towards the transaction. People aren't too bothered if you're unhappy, if you're dissatisfied. Just as long as you pay the money, you get your service, your product, you walk away. But there's others who see the opportunity to deepen relationships through service. One example I often use is that of a bank account. When my wife and I were over here a few months ago, my wife took the opportunity to open up a bank account. She walked in, immediately the security guard starts giving service, inquiring what she needs, directing her to the right place, helping her to get the ticket to queue. She sits, she waits, the bank uh, clerk is very polite, very helpful, immediately diagnoses her needs, the account gets opened, it's real smooth, all the uh, process is streamlined, and then she asks, uh, do you need internet banking? Well, my wife said that would be uh, useful, so immediately she uh, sets that up and then asks, do you have the software? No software, so here's a USB with the software on it. Do you know how to use it? Well, I'm not sure. So then she gives a little tutorial on how to use the internet banking. And as the process is finishing up, she promises that the uh, account will be ready the next day. She provides the PIN and the card and all the other information that's needed. I'm kind of skeptical. Till we go the next day, the account works, we draw out cash, everything is smooth. So this bank is taking the uh, opportunity to build relationship through service. Is this someone I'd recommend? For sure. Is this someone that my wife has already recommended? For sure. Now, of course, maybe things will go a little strange on the back end, but they're seeing it as an opportunity to connect actively with customers. So we're talking about the logic of sustainability, the opportunity for mutual benefit. And this brings us right round to the benefit opportunities that many of you will know from service. What opportunities and benefits does it bring? It brings word of mouth, positive influence on purchase decisions. Services, when we choose a service, typically word of mouth plays a very, very important role. Loyalty. Professor Reichel has done a lot of work on this. He shows that good service drives bottom line profit. That's bottom line profit. Other areas. It insulates from the competition. When complaints occur, mistakes occur, all businesses make mistakes. All uh, companies receive complaints. But service has an insulating effect that as long as we don't make too many, customers are more willing to uh, forgive and ultimately it helps reduce failure costs when things go wrong. Acquiring new customers is an expensive business. Service helps reduce that cost by turning satisfied customers into walking adverts and ultimately co-producers. Think of yourself in line when you have a problem at a, at a self-service machine. Often another customer comes up and helps you figure out which button to press and so on. They're co-producing service. Satisfied customers go into the mode of not only positively advocating what's being done, 
talking your company up, but often help other customers to solve problems and ultimately create sustainable advantage. The way people operate in contacts builds a very high barrier to uh, competitors entering the space. So there's clearly a whole number of benefits of service that some companies are getting engaged with. But then this raises a key issue. What actually is good service? Now to engage with this, what I'd like to do is a, a short exercise and this exercise focuses on your experience here as, as customers. So we've got three basic steps. Please think of uh, product, service provider, you know, it might be a hotel, restaurant and so on, something that you're familiar with, but someone who's retained you as a loyal customer for quite some time. Now individually, identify what exactly was done. What are some of the things that really impressed you? Don't just write good service because that doesn't tell us too much, but what specifics made you really feel this is someone you want to go back to? Someone that you would safely tell your friends is a, is a good provider. And then, if time permits, have a little discussion in groups to see uh, if there's a pattern. Okay, this has been a very interesting discussion. And what I've done here is on the uh, flip chart on the left, I've marked up uh, in the green what have really come from predominantly Western members of the audience, and in the red at the bottom what are coming from the members of the audience here today who are primarily from the Far East, so either local to China, from Taiwan, or other Far Eastern environments. Let's take this into what research shows us. So we've got the green up at the top on our flip chart, Western perspectives, and at the bottom here, the red, which are Far Eastern perspective. Now, in the uh, mid-80s, uh, Professor Paris Heumann, a very uh, famous uh, academic, just asked the simple question that I posed before. In other words, what is service quality? And his answer came back. Reliability, keeping promises made to the customer, dependability, accuracy, assurance, which focuses on knowledge and courtesy of staff, tangibles, so actually the physical environment, anything else that's associated that's tangible, tickets and so on, empathy, so the caring, individualized attention that customers are provided by the firm, and responsiveness, just the willingness to help customers. Now we can see from the flip chart, I think Charlie over here uh, from America really emphasizes very clearly, I want to get what I want to get. In other words, give me what you've promised me. That's absolutely reliability. And we see that in the research, this comes out as number one. Sorry, there's a slight uh, slide build problem assurance has come twice. Now, number one, research shows that typically reliability is rated number one in importance by Western customers. So Charlie mentioned it, several other Western members of the audience also mentioned that idea of getting what's promised. Give me what you've promised you'll give me. This is reliability. Now, by contrast, looking at the bottom part of the flip chart, we think, see things like friendliness, comfortable. These are things that the Far Eastern members of the audience have mentioned. Now these fit to Chinese culture that has this idea of a passion for relationship. Relationship is very critical in uh, local culture and many people attribute this to the idea of Confucianism that it focuses on the issue of harmony, where we avoid conflict and of course avoid complaints. So typically customers are unhappy, don't tell us. Now, when we think about the uh, literature, when we think about uh, research, for example, by the Technical Assistance Research Program in the US, we find that uh, less than 5% of cl complaints made by customers reach senior management. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that actually 
95 out of 100 dissatisfied customers are walking around telling others they may have switched firms but they're word of mouth out there. Now, in this situation, we find that even less of this word of mouth will come back to uh, the firm because of that issue of avoiding conflict, keeping a sense of comfort and harmony. You know, sacrifice, compromise is the norm. People tend to compromise to keep others happy and comfortable. So it's a concept of sacrificing I for we, we being the common good. And groups and networks are regulated right from close bonds with family right out to acquaintances. So it has some wider implications in terms of service. If I know you, you're more likely to get better service. Service provides opportunities for connection, opportunities for relationship that form the centre of the way society is operating. And there's that sense of obligation, in other words, uh, by helping someone we build that sense of reciprocation, expected return of favour at some time in the future. So much of this is focusing on relationship, the way we connect, the way we operate. So what does this tell us? What's the punchline, if you like? The punchline becomes how we interact is, or even more important, as what we interact for. So the process of our interaction is actually often more important than necessarily the outcome element, which takes, particularly for those who come from a Western mindset, we've seen here on our flip chart, we're emphasising reliability, we're emphasising outcome in the uh, green section at the top. The bottom section, we've got words like friendliness, comfortable, that it's easy to get along with others. These are all things that reflect process, how we interact. So this striking difference led me to start saying, well, what actually is good service in Chinese cultural settings? Clearly we can see, just in this limited audience here, we're seeing very different things as important. So in order to try and unpick this, I've looked at core retail settings like restaurants, hypermarkets, banks. And my findings show service quality develops relationships through a number of areas. These are possible, what I label developers in relationship. Well, the first one we talk about is the idea of qin qie, which are warm behaviours, helping customers to create a sense of closeness. So this helps customers feel a sense of closeness with the provider. We'll cut to a little video now where we walk into that experience. So that video has showed us a very simple retail experience where polite behaviours, eye contact, genuine warmth towards the customer leaves a positive warm feeling particularly for those who are of that same background. What else is important? Active service, voluntarily helping, offering help and anticipating needs. Go back to this idea of what it means uh, from a Chinese point of view. I don't particularly want to stand out. We're focusing on we, not I. What does that mean? It means that I don't necessarily want to be difficult or awkward and start to ask for something. I hope that you'll anticipate my needs without me needing to particularly say, I want, because that makes you stand out uncomfortably in the group. So let's cut to a little video here and see what that shows us about active service. So here we see active service in the video 
What has that shown us? It's shown us a customer at the checkout. She doesn't even have eye contact with the uh, with the teller. But he started to check out her goods. He obviously thinks it'd be much more convenient if he has a she has a cart. He signals to his supervisor to bring the cart, and he starts to load her items in. Now that avoids she doesn't even need to ask. Please give me a cart. It's actually provided. It's given. Maybe she doesn't want it, but the anticipation of possible need will satisfy because it communicates something about being caring, being empathetic, being thoughtful towards the uh, customer. Here in the uh, slides you can see there's a waiter helping the uh, customer to uh, serve the fish. So again, that's avoiding the customer needing to ask, you know, what's the best way to uh, open the fish? They just do it right for you. They anticipate that this might be difficult, that it would be something that will make the customer feel positive and comfortable. And finally, the third key dimension is that of respect. Polite, responsive and responsible behaviours that take account of social status. Again, we'll have a quick look at a video here that helps you connect up with what that is about. Okay, so here we've seen the customer being given a product in the hypermarket. What happens? The teller avoids direct eye contact because that might seem challenging. Gentle bow of the head shows respect. This customer is clearly uh, a little bit older, a mature customer. Uses two hands to give the product to the customer and politely indicates the way that she should move away from the checkout. So the process involves both, a, both language and body language to demonstrate the sense of respect. Responsive behaviours that take account of that lady's particular social status. So these are three elements, chin chie, active service, respect, that act in a way to develop service relationship with customers. They're both actual behaviours and they're also words that are used. So both behaviours, verbal and non-verbal, that communicate to the customer warm, positive and familiar things that attract and ultimately can retain customers. Let's move to the idea of service quality and what I label the terminators. There's certain things that hinder service quality, hinder the development of relationship, the way that certain aspects of service can prevent the customer being engage and positively. The first one is hard sell. So that continuous pressure to purchase despite a refusal. So there's pressure to buy even though the customer has said no. And then secondly, research has shown that policy and procedure, so this overzealous application of rules, policies, procedures, and what leaves the customer feeling very uncomfortable in a Chinese setting. Now this isn't just bureaucracy. This is easy to say, well, we all dislike bureaucracy. Hey, yes, we all do. But actually, let's have a look at this clip because this helps you connect with how this is interpreted here. Let's have a look at that. Okay, so we saw this lady, the, we sorry, not a lady, <laughs> in this case uh, uh, a man going to purchase product. And he's asked here, is there a discount on this particular item? And then, as the conversation goes on, it's clear that the discount is only offered after 8 o'clock, and he's earlier than that in the evening. But he tries to keep the situation smooth, comfortable, harmonious by saying, ah, no problem, because that lady's apologetic, she clearly wants to try and help him, he says, no problem, next time I know to come back a little later, and it seems like the transaction's over. 
and she just finishes serving another customer as he's moving away she starts up conversation again she says to him look I'm real sorry I'd love to help you but the problem is as you go through the checkout there's a security guard and it would be very awkward if I mark the item down you know I but what I could do is I can mark it down I can keep it for you till a little bit later and then you could come and pick it up now what is she showing us? She's actually showing us that policy and procedure becomes a barrier to her giving the sort of warm service that she wants to give to that customer. Very simple transaction. We're talking a few minutes contact, if that, across this particular purchase of the uh, chicken in the video. But this lady clearly sees and really wants to exploit this opportunity to give a chin chair feel. Policy and procedure becomes a barrier that limits that, particularly in this formal, formalised retail situation. OK, a summary. What are the key ideas that I hope that you'll walk away with today? One key issue is that market research hides subtle but important meanings. Let me explain what I mean here. Tesco, we're probably all familiar with Tesco, it's a very big international retailer. It uh, closely follows Walmart and Carrefour as a global retailer, global grocer and provider of uh, both uh, uh, food and uh, household items. Now they're a careful company, they do their research, they do their market research, as I'm sure many of you do when you go to enter a new market to try and understand both customer expectations for product range, but also for service. Their research said, well, okay, few parameters, customers say, help me to find what I want to find. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, this is what the research told them help customers to find what they want to find. Now if you walk into a Western store, a Western Tesco, right up there on the wall you'll have a board that shows you the layout of the store. It's very easy to find um, where the groceries are, where the food is, where the milk is, where the tea is, where the coffee is. There's a map it shows you. You can navigate really easily. People in the store are also trained. What are they trained to do? To tell you exactly where products are located in the store. They have all the signs on the aisles. These really focus on telling customers super clearly what's in this aisle. Help me find what I want to find. But what does research show happens here in a Chinese situation? What are customers actually saying? Well, when you talk to customers, when you research the problem, you find that customers are actually saying, what I want to find are bargain items, discount items, something that's special help me define that. So suddenly that puts a different interpretation on this very simple statement. Let me find what I want to find. So customers are saying, show me where the bargain items are. Arrange the store that's in an interesting way so that I can navigate through and find items that I hadn't thought of buying but are on a special offer, have discount, have special properties, something that's going to attract me. So this then engages customers in a different way. So when we've been talking today, what we've been talking about today is the idea of service quality. We've seen very tangibly and very clearly on the flip chart two different perspectives on service. One focuses on the Western mindset orientated towards reliability. Give me what I want when I want it. A Chinese cultural perspective that says make my interaction with you friendly, make it sincere, make it comfortable, make it familiar. That is much more important. So getting into this mindset becomes a strategy for being... So the important issue is a Western point of view of being reliable but cold is unlikely to reap the long-term benefits of service. 
Chinese customers prefer warm contacts that offer the possibility of relationship. And ultimately, they may be quite quick to forgive a lack of reliability if service communicates harmony, friendliness, active and chinchir closeness. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this has uh, taken you some way in your journey towards service quality and localizing it to a Chinese cultural space. Thanks very much. This is Talk of Asian Marketing with a special emphasis on localized Chinese consumer behavior. Our website is ccc.qbook.tv where you can find other audio and video episodes with photos, links, and information related to today's conversation. Subscribe to leave comments and access research episodes with applied topics and research reports.